Tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. And now, on with our feature presentation. There are certain days that you have that seem like Murphy's Law in action, where everything that could possibly go wrong does. There are certain days where you just feel like nothing is going your way, and where no one told you life was going to be this way. And even with NFL players, that's true. Maybe you dropped a big pass or made a big error. Maybe you got injured and now your career is in jeopardy. Maybe you just lost a ton of money after getting fined by the league. You can probably think of a million other scenarios that could happen to a player, in particular, a rookie who is just getting adjusted to life in the NFL, that would make for an absolutely horrible day where nothing goes according to plan. But I promise you that nothing compares to what this man right here went through. This is New York Giants wide receiver Tim Carter, and on November 24th, 2002, he lived through an absolutely atrocious day where the injury that he suffered was the least of his concerns. Carter didn't exactly do a whole lot in his NFL career, and for many people who remember him, his lasting legacy is how he suffered one of the worst days of any player in the history of the National Football League, and at the very least, one of the worst days of any player in the history of the New York Football Giants. And this is the story behind Tim Carter and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Before I talk about the actual day in question and just what went wrong, because trust me, a lot of stuff went wrong on this day, we need some context to understand who Tim Carter is, and how his time with the Giants was going before this incident. Entering the 2002 season, it was clear that the Giants had a major need to fill the wide receiver position. Yes, they had Amani Toomer and Ike Hilliard, and Toomer in particular was coming off of a 1,000-yard season, but they just lost one of their top guys in free agency, Joe Jaravicious, after he signed a four-year contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Giants were lacking any good receivers outside of those top two options, as even though they hoped that Ron Dixon, their third-round pick from 2000, could be a good depth option, it was becoming more apparent with each passing day that this experiment would not work out. Needing depth at receiver like humans need air to breathe, the Giants spent two of their seven picks on wide receivers. One of them was a seventh-round pick spent on Daryl Jones, a receiver from Miami, Florida, who caught just eight passes during his NFL career, so he didn't do a whole lot. But the other one was the guy you've been watching this whole time, because with pick number 46, the Giants spent their second-round pick in the 2002 NFL Draft on Auburn wide receiver Tim Carter. While Carter was primarily known for his special teams abilities with the Tigers, as he finished third in the SEC in 2000 in yards per kickoff return, and fourth in the SEC in 2001 in that same category, he was also a pretty solid receiver. In 2001, as a junior, Carter had 35 receptions for 570 yards and 3 touchdowns, finishing inside the top 10 of the conference in yards per catch at 16.3, and leading the team in every receiving category, including receptions, receiving yards, yards per reception, and receiving touchdowns. The Giants liked Carter a lot, and they were hoping that he could bolster a passing attack that needed someone to step up now that Jarevicius was no longer there. However, it didn't quite work out that way at first. Whereas they got tons of production out of their first-round rookie pick that year, with tight end Jeremy Shockey being named the Pro Bowler and a first-team All-Pro, things didn't quite work out the same with their second-round pick in Tim Carter. He missed the first month of the season with a rib fracture, kidney problems, and with ongoing back pain. Unfortunately for Carter, he was not progressing or healing like he hoped he would, saying on his progress, every day is the same pain. At times, I get frustrated. I'm just waiting to be 100%. How long it will take me, I don't know. And while he eventually recovered, finally getting to play for the first time in Week 5 against the Dallas Cowboys, he didn't do a whole lot, as during those first five games, he recorded two receptions and never found the end zone. Carter was taking his time climbing up the depth chart and making an impact in the offense. And unfortunately for Carter, that impact never came as a rookie. Because in Week 10, during the second quarter of a 27-20 victory on the road against the Minnesota Vikings, Carter tore his right Achilles tendon. Everyone felt absolutely terrible for Carter, and understandably so. Quarterback Jason Garrett said that what hurt the most was that he was going to get the ball in the play in question, and Tiki Barber said that he was bummed, saying he was just starting to play and get his opportunity. Now, it's taken away just like that. Understandably, Carter was out for the season, and he was placed on injured reserve, freeing up much-needed roster space since the Giants were now down to only four healthy wide receivers, with one of them being Sean Bennett, who at the start of the month was a running back. Not ideal. So you think the troubles with Carter's rookie season are over, right? 
it was a horrible season for him where he wasn't too productive on the field, and where off the field, he suffered a slew of bad injuries and just couldn't stay healthy. Well, that's where you would be mistaken. Because on November 24th, 2002, just four days before Thanksgiving, he was about to make headlines for the worst day imaginable. Usually when a player is on injured reserve, depending on the severity of the injury, they will not travel with the team. They'll be there to support the team during the home games and will show up to the facility to rehab and do everything that they need to. However, it's not uncommon for players to just not travel with the team, since it would be too much of a hassle. That was the case with Tim Carter. He was two weeks removed from a torn Achilles tendon, was not feeling any better, and was still on crutches and hobbling. It probably would not have been the best idea to fly and make the four-hour trek from Newark to Houston. So during Week 12, when the Giants were traveling to take on the Texans in an interconference matchup, Carter was watching the game at home on television, hoping his team could prevail. And to say that this game was important for the Giants would be a massive understatement. This game almost felt like the definition of a must-win. Aside from the fact that this was the first ever competitive meeting that the Giants would have against the Texans, which is always exciting to play a new team for the first time, this game was critical in New York's push for the playoffs. The Giants entered this game at 6-4, one game behind the Philadelphia Eagles for the division lead in the NFC East. On top of that, as things stood, if the season ended today, the Giants would be out of the playoffs, as they were half a game behind the Atlanta Falcons for the number 6 seed, with the Falcons sitting at 6-3-1. A loss here by the Giants would make their road to playing January football incredibly difficult, barring the team running the table and having a few things fall their way. Fortunately, it's not like the Texans were a good team. This was a team that was an expansion team in its very first season. A team that entered this game at 2-8, having dropped 8 of their last 9 games. And a team that had the worst offense in the AFC, and the second worst point differential in all of football. There was no reason the Giants should be losing this game. Right? Well, think again. Because sure enough, the Giants picked a really bad time to lay an egg, as they lost this game 16-14 to fall to 6-5, sliding further and further out of the playoff picture, and the NFC East title hunt. The Giants turned it over three times, with Kerry Collins having an abysmal game under center, going 18 for 41 and completing less than 44% of his passes while throwing two interceptions and posting a pass rating of 48.2, which was his second worst rating of the season. When you have 14 drives in a game and six of them end in punts, with another four of them ending in a turnover or a safety, you're not going to win too many games that way. It was a bad loss for the Giants especially considering the circumstances as five-and-a-half-point favorites, and it was a loss that left many wondering whether the Giants had a realistic shot at keeping their season alive. Carter was watching this game at home, in agonizing pain from his torn Achilles tendon injury, and he was unable to do anything about it. Upset about watching whatever the heck the Giants and their offense put on display that day, and with the Sunday Night Football game being an AFC matchup between the Indianapolis Colts and Denver Broncos that had no implication whatsoever on the playoff picture in the NFC, he decided that he was going to try and cheer up and take his mind off of things by going to the movies. And what was supposed to be a fun night at the movies became anything but that. On November 22nd, two days before the Giants-Texans game, a movie that changed cinema forever was released. Because that day, the world got to experience the cinematic masterpiece known as Friday After Next. This was the third installment of Ice Cube's Friday trilogy, and the movie did not exactly get the best reviews, receiving a 26% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and only making $33.5 million at the box office. While that's pretty good considering its $10 million budget, as the movie made about 3.5 times its budget, it was the lowest ratio of the entire trilogy. Still, there was an audience for this movie, and Tim Carter wanted to see it. So that Sunday night, he went to the AMC Multiplex in Clifton Commons, which for some perspective, is still around today, and is less than five miles away from Giants Stadium. The plan for Carter was simple. He would see the movie, which was airing sometime around 10 o'clock, and would be back at his place by midnight. The movie was less than 90 minutes long. But after Carter got out of the theater and went to his car, the unthinkable happened. He was carjacked. Now the two men tried to steal his BMW while Carter was in the theater, but they were unable to do so, as there was a security system in the car with a microchip in the ignition and the key, making the car impossible to start without a key. So they waited until Carter got out of the theater so they could take the car. As Carter approached his car while on crutches, the two guys walked up to him, and Carter unfortunately knew exactly what was going to happen. Carter said, 
I felt the guys walking up on me, and I was mentally prepared for the situation. One of the guys had a gun that he stuck in my ribs. He said, give me the keys. I turned around and gave him the keys. I thought he was just going to take the car, but then he told me to get in the back seat. And from there, the carjackers did their damage. For the next three and a half hours, with Carter hobbled and in the back seat unable to do anything, the carjackers used Carter's ATM card and went to mini marts across the area, evading the cops in the process. By the time it was 3.30 in the morning, with Carter thinking he'd be well asleep and getting ready to go to the facility the next day for rehabbing, he had over $10,000 worth in jewelry stolen, his car stolen, along with some cash, credit cards, ATM cards, and even his crutches. Carter was left with nothing except for $40, which the carjackers graciously gave him so he could have money to pay for a cab back home. To Carter's credit, he handled the situation pretty much perfectly. Not once did he inform the carjackers that he was an NFL player, which Robert Rowan, the detective captain of the Clifton Police Department, said was a smart move on his part. As Rowan said, that was the smart thing to do. Once they know that, you never know which way these things can turn. And if Carter was frustrated and angry at the carjackers, he didn't show it, keeping his cool the entire time and displaying incredible composure in press conferences afterwards about the incident. Carter said, We both knew our goals. I wanted to get home unharmed. They wanted the car. For them, it's just business. He even went as far as calling the carjackers very civil, which I'd be lying if I said that I'd be calling them civil in the days after the incident. It was Carter's first time getting carjacked, saying that prior to this, he never owned a car that was worth carjacking. But everyone gave him immense credit for how he handled the entire mess, which considering the fact that there was a gun involved, easily could have been a life or death situation. And unfortunately for Carter, even though his car was eventually found, it was completely gone, as his 2001 white BMW M3 was no more. The carjackers abandoned it underneath the Hayes Avenue Bridge, took the wheels and the audio equipment out, and burned the rest of the car down. Rowan said that the car was so badly burnt, when the police and firefighters found it two days later, it took them several hours to even determine just what type of car it was, and that the car was so badly damaged that there was nothing of evidentiary value left. And as far as I could tell, because Carter's description of the carjackers was not very descript, as his description was that they were in their 20s wearing black clothes and ski masks, the police were never able to arrest the criminals. What was an already difficult rookie season for Carter was made even worse, and Giants general manager Ernie Accorsi couldn't do anything except express sorrow for him, saying, I feel so bad for this kid. What he's gone through, it's just such a shame. And the worst part of it all was that this wasn't like a Lewis Billups situation, where he had an atrocious 24 hours that ended his NFL career, but you didn't exactly feel too bad for him because he's a human piece of garbage who might be one of the worst people to ever play the sport. You can learn more about him by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Tim Carter, by all accounts, seemed like a genuinely great and nice guy, and he deserved absolutely none of this. And fortunately, he was not hurt in this incident. But unfortunately, this incident was a pretty good indication of how Tim Carter's NFL career would go, because he couldn't stay healthy, couldn't catch a break, and he couldn't make much of an impact with the Giants. Carter played with New York until 2006, and in that time, only recorded 72 receptions for 967 yards and three receiving touchdowns, starting a mere 11 games. To illustrate just how unlucky his career was, in a 2003 game against the Atlanta Falcons, he had what was quite easily the best game of his career at the time, having four receptions for 56 yards. However, he had to leave the game because of a concussion. Still, because of his great performance, he earned the right to make his first ever start the following week against the Philadelphia Eagles and he left that game early because of a concussion. Some guys literally just can't catch a break. He was traded to the Cleveland Browns in 2007, and eventually was out of the NFL after 2009, following a brief stint with the St. Louis Rams. It's safe to say that Carter didn't exactly do a whole lot in his NFL career, but in terms of the worst moment, it's very easy to pinpoint what exactly that was. Just to recap everything bad that happened on November 24, 2002, he had a torn Achilles tendon and was in immense pain. While being away from his team and being forced to watch helplessly through the TV screen, he saw his team lose to an expansion team in what felt like a must-win game. He then went and saw a horrible movie. After watching that movie, he got carjacked, with his car getting stolen and then burnt to the ground. He also lost his ATM card, his credit card, and $10,000 worth of jewelry, and was held against his will for a solid four hours 
while being driven around the back roads of New Jersey late at night. This truly was a case of everything going wrong that could have possibly gone wrong. Because when Carter woke up that Sunday and hoped that he could witness a long drive, this definitely was not what he had in mind. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.